listening to BBC Radio Wales. It is the evening show with me, Vicky Blight. Just gone quarter past eight. And let me welcome our guest this evening, Mr. Steve Balsamo. How are you? Very good, Vicky. How are you doing? I'm very well. I'm chuffed that we've managed to uh, grab a bit of your time yeah. this evening. And I'm not alone. Loads of people getting involved on the uh, socials this evening. Looking forward oh. to hearing from you, Karen, and Jim, Michelle, Kerry, just to name a few. Uh, so they've they've all got wow. us switched on tonight and uh, looking forward to hearing what you've been up to. How's 2022 treating you so far? Better than 2021, I've got to be honest. It was, uh, it's been a strange... It's been a strange time for, for everyone, obviously. Uh, the arts have suffered immensely. But I just took time to write songs, you know. I, I got together with one of my old mates from the stories, Andy Collins, and we joined up with a guy called Pete Riley from Liverpool, and we, we kind of started writing every Monday. This is a really like a exciting project because I've I've kind of been across this, but but it all started on Zoom, right? Which musicians are finding yeah. tricky when you when you're trying to you know play stuff through and and get a sense of what everyone's doing. Well, there's a little bit of latency, which means there's a slight delay. So if you try and play songs, my timing isn't the best anyway. But if you try and play <laughs> songs down the line, it, it kind of it's all off a little bit. But I found. You know, there's nothing like getting in a room and writing songs. It's one of my favorite things to do in life, really, because you start with nothing in the morning, cups of tea or beer, or, you know, whatever's your, your tipple, and then you kick a few ideas around. There's a little bit of therapy that happens. And then by the end of the day, some strange alchemy occurs, some magic, hopefully, and then you've got, you've got something. So there's nothing like being in a room. But I really loved the process on Zoom because... <laughs> it was almost like a Nashville thing where you get in a room and do a three-hour session and then, then you're out. So I found it really efficient and we'd throw ideas around in the week on, on WhatsApp. So it all became about technology and ideas were flying back and forth through the ether. And then we we get together on a Monday, kick some ideas around and very soon we had about a dozen songs, which, uh, you know, we put, we put it together for an EP, which is really exciting. So did you go into it? with the intention of collaborating and, and forming Balsamo Collins Riley, was that always the aim or was it literally something to do each week to keep the mind active and, and the creative juices flowing? That's exactly what it was. There was no intention with anything. It was just to try and keep our heads out of the shed and and not, not go crazy, you know, and just, just keep keep being creative and keep, keep sharpening the tools. And, uh, yeah, we there was a lot of therapy. We talked about a lot of stuff and put the world to rights and so on. But yeah, we we started then digging into some songs because that's all we we could do in response to what was going on. Of course, we couldn't play and we couldn't meet and all of that. But we just tried to stay as creative as possible. And and as a result, we've got you know a bunch of songs that are going to become an EP, which we're going to release very soon. We're going to play one of the songs later. The first time it's ever been heard anywhere in the world so this is exciting that's a, that's a thrill it is <laughs> so, it is and, and so you know thank you for sharing as well i mean it's thank you i think well, i've been speaking to a lot of musicians over the last sort of three months doing this show and something that has come out of all of our chats about the pandemic obviously an incredibly sad time and so many different emotions for everybody to deal with in all walks of life um do you think in some ways, when we actually have time to process the last couple of years and, and, and how life has changed and, and what it means going forward, do you think we'll look back at this period of time and actually see it, reflect on it as an incredibly creative moment of time? I, th I, think, I think so personally. Um, I think we're all still processing it. And the word unprecedented was, was used all the time. And it was an unprecedented thing that the, the whole thing shut down. So, but as I said before, but being a creative, just my response and the response of my, my creative kind of colleagues was to just write some stuff and write about it. And I did more collaboration with songwriters in other parts of the world than I've ever done. So from a creative point of view, it was a very, very cool thing. From, from, every, from you know, I didn't get to see my dad. My dad's got dementia, unfortunately. And, by the time we got around to see him, a lot of his kind of cognitive functioning had gone downhill. 
So they were, you know, and I knew people who passed away. So they were, you know, terrible things. But from a creative point of view, I think um, it was one of the most, you know, fertile times of my life, really. Being able to sort of connect with that inner emotion. And, and you're very fortunate in the yeah. fact that you have the ability to turn that into something beautiful and into music and into poetry and and that's an incredible gift and talent was was writing something that you did sort of religiously every single day before the pandemic did you always cut away time each day to to kind of really hone that craft and keep going and keep it sharp yeah i i try and do the way i write songs or or do anything creative i i have to work at it i've i can i, I was lucky enough to have a good voice but the the craft of songwriting, I think, is a craft. And there are people who are, you know, naturally gifted. Neil Finn, for example, from Crowded House is one of my heroes. And I think he could make anything sound great. So there are people who are, and and um, Justin Curry from Delamitri, another guy who I absolutely love as a songwriter. So I think people, people like those guys are really just naturally gifted. But I've got to chip away at it. And I, I try and do something every day. So I've got a phone full of, hundreds of little voice notes or bits of lyrics on my phone i drive my kids and my wife absolutely bonkers by <laughs> just always always noodling stuff it's... and what i tend to do then is go back and, and listen a couple of weeks later and if anything kind of sticks out or sounds kind of hooky I'll, I'll just dig in or pass it to some of the guys i write with and yeah so i i'm a i'm a very um you know i, I clock in and clock out i try and do a little bit every day it's like it's, it is a job and I think sometimes we forget that uh, being a musician is a full-time job and uh, yeah like you say you've got to you've got to work at it when you when you stepped away from the kind of band environment how did how did you feel at that point in your career and in your life did you feel like your safety net had had gone a little bit when you started working on your your own solo stuff so what happened so my my kind of journey in music is I was in a I was in bands when I was a kid and started writing pretty much straight on. There was a fellow I was in a band with in Swansea called Stuart Leary, and we were in a kind of heavy rock band. It was kind of it was uh, early late eighties, early nineties. So it came out of that hair metal thing, which we all I still love all that stuff, man. All the Def Leppard and everything. I just love it because they were great songs, great pop songs, really. So there's a guy called Stu Leary, and he was a great songwriter. So I got a lot of inspiration from him. And my brother was in a band, Andrew, and I, I just loved, you know, what he was about. And I just loved that he could get girlfriends really easy. And <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, I'm going to give this a whirl. So so I started in bands then. So what happened then was I, I helped a friend audition for Neath College. Uh, and he was a guitarist and he needed a singer to sing uh, Bohemian Rhapsody for him. So I, I stepped in and I was offered a place on, at, in East College. And when I joined the course, they, they said, right, we're going we're gonna to do a production of Jesus Christ Superstar. We wanted to play Jesus. And I remember hearing that musical when I was a kid. And hadn't, you know, I, was, I didn't grow up listening to musicals. I was just into kind of rock and roll music, really. So I heard the original version by Ian Gillen, the singer with Deep Purple, and I was a huge Deep Purple fan. So we did that in college, and I remember thinking at the time, I'm going to do this again somehow. It was a very uncanny feeling, Vicky, that somewhere in my life I would cross paths with, with the loincloth. So, uh, <laughs> Interesting. After, <laughs> after that, yeah, it's very weird. So after, after that, I was taught a song from Les Miserables, by Rian, who, who was the piano and vocal teacher at Neath College at the time on the performing arts course. A couple of weeks later, there was an open audition for Les Mis, and I basically got the three o'clock train in the morning, went up, did an open audition, and got in and left college. I was only there about seven or eight months, left college and joined the the, the first tour in production of Les Mis, Gosh. went to Dublin and Edinburgh. So I literally kind of learned the ropes on the job. And I don't think... It's, it would be very unlikely for that to happen these days, firstly because the students are so brilliantly trained and they you know everyone's triple threat these days they can dance sing and act and, and you know all, all sorts of stuff. So I literally walked off the street, had a voice that sounded very similar to the guy who originated the role of Sean Valjean, Cole Wilkinson because I've got quite a floaty kind of you know falsetto type voice and I, and I got in. so I learned 
all of that then and then decided I was going to come back to Swansea, put a band back together because theatre wasn't my thing. And then a, a guy who was in the, the show with me, Johnny, he was an actor. He became an agent and called me a few years later and said, and it was this was a weird thing as well, because my brother called me that morning, Andrew, and said, hey, they, Andrew Lloyd Webb has been on the telly and he's looking for a Jesus. And I was like, mm, that's interesting. And then Johnny, who was my old mate from Les Mis, he called me and said, hey, Angela Webb is looking for a Jesus. I said, hey, my brother just told me that. And he said, do you still know that big song, Gethsemane? I said, yeah, I, I think so. Come up and sing it for me. So I went to London. Uh, he was living in Guildford at the time. I went to Guildford, sang it for him in his front room a cappella. And he was like, right. He rang the casting director, a guy called David Grinrod, the next day. And, uh, and they saw me. And I remember at the audition, David cried. Because uh, the song's quite a big emotional kind of journey song. And uh, that was the beginning of 14 auditions. And then I got the gig. And then soon after I got signed to Sony. So it was like a, it was just a crazy, crazy time. And then, so I left the theater and then made a record for Sony. And that's a whole other adventure in itself. Gosh, I, I didn't realize that you literally were at college when you got that role in Les Mis. Like I didn't realize yeah. how kind of, fresh and new it was at that point i it's it must have been an incredible leap and and to find yourself in a, a very different world it was vicky and i tell you what was interesting we're putting together a a big gala performance at the grand theater i'll, I'll talk about that in a little while this new kind of uh, creative collective i'm involved with but ria jones is going to be taking part in that and she came down uh, i think it was last week or the week before to meet us all at the grand theater and she remembered, because we were talking about it, because Rhea was in, she's a, 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 Rhea Jones is a famous Welsh musical theatre actress, brilliant as well. And um, she was in the the cast at the time that, that I auditioned. And the guy who was one of the directors, Ken Caswell, who's also from, from around, uh, he's Welsh, I think he's from Swansea, actually. He went to Rhea and said, oh, we've seen this boy. We think he's great, but he's still in college. And Rhea told me the other day that she'd said, oh, give him a chance. So Gosh. I think it was Rhea's give him give him a chance that kind of got me the gig, which I never, I'd never heard before. So it was just amazing to to hear that and reconnect. So thanks, Rhea, if you're listening. Yeah. <laughs> it's, or, it's, or not. <laughs> it's always crazy, isn't it, sometimes, how those uh, passing connections can make uh, yeah. an incredible difference in your life. I'm going to play one of your tracks now, and I believe that this is the first song that you ever wrote all on your own. It is. I've always loved collaborating, as I said before. I just love that connection and, you know... <laughs> The, the kind of deep therapy that happens sometimes when you get together, especially with people you don't know. You, you get into a room in the morning and you you, you you have to, you know, lay your cards on the table and heart on your sleeve and all those cliches and then get get to work. But I started this song in another songwriting session and put it away on my phone and then came back to it months and months later and thought there's something in that and the song literally wrote itself really quickly and I didn't need any other help. And it was it was a big moment. And this was a, a former um, Welsh A-list on Radio Wales. Thanks very much, Radio Wales, for the support. And uh, it was a thrill to hear that on the radio for the first time. Oh, it must be. And uh, a bit different to uh, listening back to little bits and pieces on your voice notes and things. Yeah. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's play it now. This is Steve Balsamo and Ships. <laughs> So deep that I can't see you. I think I'm gonna take my love down low. But right about now, I need another drink. The bottle from the wreck, it helps me think. Prefer looking at me than I shrink. The bottle from the wreck, it helps me think. The passing light of day The island of different oceans Keeps us away We've been pulled apart By the light of 
Steve Balsamo and Ships playing here on BBC Radio Wales. And Steve joins me tonight as my very special guest. So what's the meaning behind the song then, apart from the obvious with, with Ships? <laughs> well, I think I, I'm, I'm, I really love songs that kind of look back and are nostalgic and I love the yearning. I'm a big fan of Don Henley, for example, and he's a he's a master of capturing kind of yearning melodies and yearning lyrics. So I'm just trying to do my best Don, really. <laughs> but a big shout out as well to Tim Hamill, who I've been working with. We worked out this, I was 50 last year, so I've been working with Tim in the studio for 30 years, Gosh. on and off. And he's down in, in Tlatli, and he's just a... He's just a master. He's, he records my voice better than than anyone else I've ever worked with, and I've I've worked with a few people over the years. So big shout out, Tim. But I think the song is, you know, it's about lost love and harking back to a simpler time. You know, everyone knows it, it's getting more complicated by the day. I think with uh, politics and everything else. But uh, so I think the song is about a simpler time, just and 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 not you know unrequited love and all of those things that we all can can uh, you know understand really it's just a simple song simple love song i i really like the way in your songwriting it feels like you kind of almost hold the listener's hand through the song <laughs> that's that's your kind of your storytelling i guess coming through but it but it really does feel wow, like a process in it and it really does feel like it's it's a nice complete journey when you listen to one of your tracks that you that you are being guided through this this Maybe it could be a, a kind of glimpse at something in your mind or a, something that everyone can relate to, as you say, but but you have a really nice, natural way of just taking the listener on a journey. So it's it's lovely to hear it, absolutely. You oh, mentioned, thank you, Vicky. That's really nice. Oh, you mentioned the project that you're working on with the Grand Theatre in Swansea. It's called Grand Ambition. And is it like a creative collective? That's exactly what it is. So about a... A year or so ago, a friend of Michael Richard Mylan, who's a great actor and a singer, actually, and a, and a writer and a director, he called me and said, look, I'm moving back to Swansea. And, you know, we've been, we've been in touch over the years, but he's kind of seen a few tweets. And I, I love supporting talent and supporting new music. One of, one, one of the loves is seeing new musicians come through and, and helping them sometimes not, not step in the same puddles that I've stepped in, really. And But I'm very interested in songwriting and the songwriting process and and whenever i do songwriting workshops or anything with with young 
writers, I learn much more than them. They learn from me. So he'd seen a bit of that and a bit of, you know, I was giving shout outs to people I love. And um, he got in touch and said, look, I want to put something together. And Rich's story is really interesting. He came like myself from a low income family from Swansea. And he was a great dancer and got support when he was young. Through Swansea Council, they paid for him to go to, a, to I think it was the Dan Dance Academy in London, and trained from when he was like 14 to 18. Then he got into the West End, and then he was off with a, a career there and a career, career in TV and film. So he wanted to come back and put something back. So he said, we had a meeting, and, and, and what happened then was he got in touch with the leader of Swansea Council, a guy called um, Rob Stewart, who's doing amazing work in Swansea. He put his, we just had a new arena in, and um, he's done a load of work with, um, they've saved the Palace Theatre in the High Street, they turn it into a, into a multi-purpose space, and the old Albert Hall has been turned into a, another gig venue. Swansea's on fire at the moment with amazing musicians and uh, Joe Bayliss, another great guy who's actually working at the arena now, put on the, the Swansea Fringe Festival for years, and he's just an amazing uh, instigator of great music. And I went out and saw the last one. It was the break in the lockdown when some bands were playing, and I, I couldn't believe the amount of talent that's in Swansea. It's just, it's just frighteningly good and so inspiring. So Rich got in touch with me and said, he, I've been in touch with the leader of the council. He, he's up for a meeting. We had a meeting then with uh, the head of culture, Tracy McNulty, and um, Robert Francis Davis, who's very high up in the council, and an amazing, another instigator of good theatre and music. And we put a proposal together about putting a creative collective together, supporting new music, supporting new writing, all through the Swansea lens, um, because there's always been an abundance of amazing writers and musicians and poets and, you know, hoodlums and <laughs> beggars and thieves in Swansea, but they've, they've, it's always been amazing. So his idea was to put together a, um, a theatrical producing house, a bit like the Sherman in Cardiff, where some of them and the other room and uh, and they, they just said, yeah, well, why don't you base yourself at the Grand Theatre? They, 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 they give us some money to start up this company. So Richard, myself, and two amazing actors, uh, Michelle McTurnan and Christian Patterson, we've come together as a creative collective. We've got over 120, 130 years experience in, in the game collectively. So over the next year, two years, three years maybe, we're going to be looking at new writing, new plays, new musicals uh, and just start creating and, and linking up with other amazing theater companies in Swansea Volcano and Flew Allen and Lighthouse and uh, to, to see if we can kind of create some new amazing cutting edge and uh, inspiring Swansea writing and kind of support the new writers at any age and any stage you know so that's that's kind of that's kind of what we're doing and I've got to say when I talk to my my friends, you know, creatives in other parts of the country, they're like, hang on a minute, what, the council have given you some money to do this? They can't believe it. So, again, massive respect to Swansea Council for, for you know, putting their money where their mouth is, literally. Yeah, putting money into the arts. I mean, yeah. you, you touched on it there, the fact that you can have incredible talent and, you know, very talented individuals, as we say, artists, bands, poets, writers, but without support, without a backbone exactly. or something to kind of, you know, uh, hold them up and, and, and push them forward. It, it's very difficult to, to move that talent to, to the next level. And, and it's so reliant, isn't it, the arts generally on, mm -hmm. on having those people with a wealth of experience to, to support the new talent coming through because that's the only way it grows. Absolutely. And we we all have a love affair with the Grand Theatre in Swansea. That it's it's loomed large in all our lives, you know, for many, many years. So it's it's an absolute joy to be in the building. The fabric of the building is deep within all our bones. So that's a beautiful thing. But also, you know, reaching out to new creatives and seeing the talent that's that's around. And you're right, we we we, we need to support the arts moving forward. During the lockdown, you know, when, when Rishi came out and said, you know, retrain. Well, I, my, my response to that was I never trained in the first place, so it doesn't really matter. But, but, but by the same token, everybody was listening to music and, you know, art, art is needed, whether 
whether we know it or not. You know, we all engage with the arts at every moment of every day, whether we watch a Netflix show or we listen to a piece of music. It's all, it's, you know, somebody's put the 10,000 hours in, somebody's put the donkey work in, somebody's, you know, literally, you know, beg, borrowed and steal to stolen to get into college or whatever it is. So, and they are, it is essential, and especially now to respond to the stuff that's going on in the world. It's, uh, it's absolutely essential. So we're, we're very privileged to be there. We pinch ourselves. It's a, it's a really beautiful um, creative collective. We, 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 we're kind of learning on our feet because we're full creative. So we've got to learn about funding and all of that. And we've started the kind of journey with funding. But we've got some great support from people at the, um, the Sherman Theatre and friends uh, of ours in, in the business. We've had just amazing amounts of feedback from everybody. So we're at the beginning of a journey, but I think it's it's really exciting. And some of the stuff that's that's coming through is just very, very inspiring. So watch this space, as they say. The vision is there. I can't wait to, yeah. to see it all become yeah. reality. Let's play another of your tracks now, Steve. This one, High on Sunset. Tell us more about ah. this. So I, I got signed to Sony Records and I got sent out to America to write songs. And it was, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. I grew up loving... American music and LA music and the, the kind of heavy rock scene of the 80s and 90s and going there and working with some of my, you know, I just met some cool people and some people that I love musician wise. I, I got to write with some of my heroes, which was brilliant. All of them were great. And, um, but what I did see was, you know, I, I was lucky again. I, I was on Sony's dollar. I'm saying at Columbia Records, so they were paying for the trip. But literally everybody in the circle of musicians and people I, I, I was in was hustling for a gig. You know, they were everybody I seemed to come across in L.A. You know, I remember going to a bar once and the guy, the, the fellow serving looked like Brad Pitt. There was this kind of everyone was hustling for a gig. And of course, the other side of it, I was told a couple of stories about some. And this was way this was in like 2001. So it was way before the Me Too movement. But I was very aware that the stuff was going on then and and. You know, there's it's a it can be a dark old place, so you've got to have your wits about you. So, I'd spent uh, four weeks in LA, loved it. I've got to be honest, because it was it was crazy. And I I remember a friend of mine said, "Oh, come to this this kind of a Buddhist meeting tonight," because I'm quite into spiritual stuff. So I went to this Buddhist meeting, and I, on the stage, I'm thinking, "God, that looks like Steven Seagal," and Steven Seagal was up there blessing people because he he's um been recognized as a lama, like a holy man from another life. So Steve Seagal, I actually went up on stage and he gave me a blessing. I thought, only in LA would this happen. Right? Only in LA. So I was, lo I was loving the craziness of it. And I just fell in love with that. I've got such a soft spot for Los Angeles. It's crazy. So I'd gone up to Canada then to work with this big hit songwriter called Dean McTaggart. We started working on the songs. We wrote a little bit of the kind of, the, the kind of a darker element um, that I saw as well, but you know, Every, everybody's kind of hustling for a gig. So it became High on Sunset. Let's hear it. Steve Balsamo on BBC Radio Wales. He's a major player Among the sharks and thieves He can snap his fingers
fucking jacks and bands. They all got a movie. That they're working on. The saints and sinners all rush down to where they know they belong. Gotta stand in line. So many dreams burn out before they got a chance to shine. High on sunset. Oh, the stars are out tonight. High on sunset. The sinking fall. Steve Balsamo, high on sunset. I can definitely hear nods to uh, one of your heroes, <laughs> Don Henley, yeah. in that track, for sure. Uh, really cool to I'll play that. I'll be in that. jail if he hears that, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Shh, it's our secret. It's our secret. Yeah, thank you. Thank so uh, bringing things right up to date then, 2022, uh, we've got Balsamo, Collins and Riley. You've mentioned that an EP is due for release soon. What's the plan for the yeah. year then? Are we going to see a tour? Are we going to see gigs? How are we going to connect with you guys how are we going to access that new material well we're gonna we're gonna play some gigs we're gonna do all that sort of stuff as things start opening up again and and tours get booked of course there's there's that kind of backlog of gigs that that have been you know cancelled and rescheduled a few times so when, when all that's out of the way we're gonna start but we've got a few little things in the pipeline the ep is coming out very soon it's being made as we speak so uh yeah we're really excited about it and this this song, again, it's uh, we all brought stuff to the table and we kicked it around and it was such a beautiful process. As I said, most of it was done on Zoom. And then when we could finally get together, Pete is from Liverpool, so it's one of my favourite cities on earth. I love Scousers so much. And Andy is a, you know, he's a beetle nut, so any any excuse to get get in the car and drive up to Mid Wales, which is a beautiful drive. If nobody's ever done it, it's well worth a, well worth a little drive. For sure. And... Uh, we spent some time there just rehearsing and stuff. And on this track, two of my favorite musicians came and, and lent their skills. Margot Buchanan, who's an amazing singer. I've done lots of singing with Margot over the years. She's a brilliant artist in her own right. And she's done loads of backup singing, everyone from Dave Gilmore to Joni Mitchell and and her husband as well, Paul Wicks Wickens, is Paul McCartney's MD and keys player. So, you know, Margot's pretty much kind of music rock and roll royalty and yeah. on guitar on dobro guitar we've got one of my favorite players on earth robbie mcintosh and robbie's played with john mayer played with mccartney i think he's up with john ilsey at the moment he's just he's just so so tasty so we reached out and we you know we were like hey do you fancy playing on these these tracks and 
they came along and did some beautiful stuff. So this song, uh, Journey Back to Me, has never been played before. So it's an exclusive, and it's such a thrill uh, to be playing it on, on your show, Vicky, and Radio Wales. Oh, it's it's very kind of you to share it with us. And, and I'm getting a sense that you're... The way that you approach your music and, and your love for the arts just generally now is about collaboration. Collaboration is at the yeah. heart of it. And, and, and it's that whole thing of whatever we think we can do on our own, we're actually stronger with other people around us, you know, and, and having your little village. And it, it seems that, you know, you guys are so well connected from your experience that you can call yeah. on these players and, and call on these talents to kind of provide those things. You kind of go, hey, I know someone who can do that better than me, so I'm going to pull them in because this is going to make it an even better experience for the listener. Absolutely. You know, Pete Riley was in a band called Treehouse, a Liverpoolian band. They signed and got signed to Atlantic in America, and he ended up, when that band broke up, he ended up playing with uh, loads. Of, they supported a load of load of bands out there, and he became a member of Edwin McCain's band. Not so well known in this country, but a big superstar out there. So you know, Pete's Pete's been you know sparring in some serious kind of circles for for many years. So with a bit of luck and a good wind, we'll be heading stateside as well as playing some gigs over here. So yeah, but we're we're really excited about it. And listen, there's. We're just doing it because we love it. We're just trying to come at it from a very soulful point of view and just see what happens. There's no kind of big plan. There's no big master plan because uh, I think best laid plans of the moment are kind of, you know, yeah. you can't plan for anything really. So we're just, just making music because we can and because we love it. And if it moves people, fantastic. But we we certainly be moved by it. Oh well, it's 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 so refreshing to to hear you coming from a place of absolute honesty and and that you are fulfilling that love for music and for art and 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 also using your beautiful voice uh, for more new material, Thank which you. we absolutely love. Thank you so much for joining us on Thank the show you tonight, so much. and hopefully we can do this in person very soon because that would be hopefully the yeah. icing on the cake. But uh, yes, this <laughs> is an exclusive, as you say, the new Balsamo Collins right. EP due soon and what will be on it this track Journey Back to Me thank you Steve thank you so much thank you
That is an exclusive, a new track from Balsamo Collins, Riley Journey, Back to Me, playing here on BBC Radio Well. Steve, my guest tonight, if you caught the back end of it and you want to listen to the whole interview, you can. You can listen back right now on BBC Sounds. This is Simon and Garfunkel.